Hello, welcome back to Black Book Stacks. I am your host, Hoshonda Sanders. And I am here with another review of a book that I just finished, which is The Kindest Lie by Nancy Johnson. It, it comes out in February. It is one of several books that come out in February that I will be talking about because here we are at a Black Book channel and it's Black History Month, so I got all kinds of galleys and I'm pretty excited to talk to you about them. Um, so this book um, is interesting to me. It is about um, a woman named Ruth and her husband Xavier and they are um, rejoicing. It is 2008 so they are rejoicing the election of President Obama and in that rejoicing uh, there are some things that come to light about um, Ruth's past. Um, and so I don't want to give away the premise or the main plot point at the center of the book. But essentially, um, there is a child that has been put up for adoption. Um, and Ruth, this is the child that Ruth had. Um, as a teenager, and she has not really, until this moment, revealed that to her husband of several years. Um, so that sends her essentially on this journey to find her child. Um, sends her back to Ganton, Indiana, and she proceeds to um, revisit the, the place that she came from. She, she currently works as a chemical engineer. Um, I believe she's in Chicago um, and uh, you know she kind of was set on this trajectory by her grandma and um, you know the, the her, her brother who all kind of sort of conspired to help her cover up this teenage pregnancy okay so much for not giving away the book but you know the way that it's rendered is gonna be amazing um, so uh, this is all done in sort of these alternating chapters between Ruth's perspective and a little white boy whose nickname is Midnight um, so what I love about this book is that it gave me a perspective about the Midwest and Midwestern black folk and white folk in ways that I think are often stereotyped um, and maybe kind of flat. It's kind of what Jessamine Ward does when she writes about the South. You see the South in a three-dimensional way as opposed to a two-dimensional or one-dimensional way, right? Which is, you know, the caricature or the stereotype. And so here we see very clearly, oh, okay, like the, the Midwest has some interesting stuff going on in terms of poverty, not as not just as poverty relates to black people and gangs as they relate to white people, but also as they relate to white people and what white poverty and white working class woes look like or at least look like um, in the early years of the Obama administration. So that's a really interesting thing to do in a novel that is presumably about an adoption <laughs> um, and it is you know that is you know obviously like a really basic plot point to be like oh yeah it's about adoption um, or it's about like a mom who like adopted who like gave her kid up for adoption when she's a teenager and like now she wants the kid back I mean that's you know that could be the elevator pitch but it's actually just like this profound study of how you render an intricate and elaborate family drama in a way that is thoughtful and beautiful. There were moments where I felt a little bit like like Lifetime movie-esque. Um, there weren't too many of them. There were just a couple. 
Um, I think this is because I watch a lot of television. So um, because I'm obsessed with narrative and story. So, so I, I, and also right now I'm reading The Queen's Gambit after like binge watching Netflix and then finally like the library had The Queen's Gambit available for me to read electronically. Um, and so um, that plus like I managed to, I realized that I was I just watched Ma Rainey's Black Bottom and then I realized that I had a, a play anthology that had the play as written by August Wilson in it and so I wanted to see the comparison between what was on screen and then what what was written right um what was omitted from what was what ended up on screen uh, which often tends to be really interesting and um but anyway, I digress. The reason why I was thinking I would mention Lifetime is because, um, you know, I think the reason why Lifetime can be super compelling, even though people kind of use it as the butt of jokes, is because it really is about the most pivotal and, um, for lack of a better word, juicy aspects of your of, of a woman's life um, of a, or of a person's, you know, experience or relationship to others. Um, and so if I were to say one thing that kind of, I never really got my arms around in the book, um, which made it a little bit difficult to finish, is I couldn't figure out really what Ruth's motivations were. Like what, like why she needed, why, why she was so driven to to all of a sudden um, reunite with this child. Um, like it was, it, it, it was explained, like it was told to us as readers, but I'm not sure that it was shown um, or felt. I don't, I'm not sure that I felt it um, as much as I understood logically that I was supposed to just understand that that was her motivation. Um, I also am not sure how strong at this point after the last four years of Trump that we, that it is, um, I'm not sure how strong of a hook or a backdrop the success or the trajectory of Obama can be um, in fictional form. I don't, I don't know that we're far enough removed from it for a narrative to kind of frame itself on that level of success even while showing us the realities of like the people who got left behind, right? Who felt like, oh, there's a black man in the White House, but I'm a black person and I still am not successful. Or I'm a white person and I deserve that kind of success, but I don't have it, so I'm resentful. Like, I think that we're still at this point, um, you know, this book will be published in February of 2021. So at this point, you know, it feels a little bit like we're not too far removed from it to, for it to exist in a, a sort of tidy enough backdrop to a story. I'll give you an example. I feel like there's been enough time between now and the Reagan era or the 90s or the 80s where when we look back on them, um, I, this is a, a bad example, but I just watched Wonder Woman 1984. So although I, I felt like the movie was like pretty anticlimactic <laughs> um, and I was sad that I felt that way because I actually really loved, you know, is it Kirsten or Kristen? Kristen Wiig as 
an apex predator. Like, I thought that was a brilliant move. But, like, you know, after that, everything just sort of, like, fell apart. I mean, before that, everything fell apart. But, like, it definitely was like, oh, this is, like, a fast spiraling train wreck. Anyway, so, um, in 1984, because it, we have enough time to have perspective and context for all that transpired in the 80s and the excess of the 80s, um, it is easy for us to kind of pin a, a plot point or pin a narrative on that whole time period because we understand a lot of what happened during that period now was, you know, 40 years have passed um, or they're about almost 40 years. Uh, so it's been four decades. Um, whereas, um, you know, it's been a little bit, it's been a little bit over 10 years. Is that right? Gosh, it's been a little bit over 10 years since um, the first black president was elected in our country. And um, it feels a little bit too soon for us to say, um, to try to weave it into history. Um, and, and maybe that's my personal read, you know, you all can read it and tell me what you think. But anyway, I, that is a very long way of saying that I, I thought the book was really well done. Um, I appreciated the, the family uh, the dialogue, you know, sort of Ruth's um, relationship with her brother Eli, um, their connection. I thought all of that was really great. Um, the one thing that I just kept like sort of snagging on, and maybe this also has to do with the fact that I'm reading, I'm still slowly making my way through, you know, President Obama's A Promised Land. Um, because of all the minutia that he includes about, um, you know, sort of background deals and all these things that we couldn't have known when he was president. So that's great information. And it's also like this needed an editor um, for like at least like 200 pages of, of the thing could be easily like left behind or put, put in another memoir since there's going to be another installment. But um, I think because I am reading him talking about some aspects of the policy um, behind the events that um, kind of unfold or impact the characters, um, like Midnight's dad, I think his name is Butch, um, in the in the kindest lie, it's like, oh, this is a lot of Obama. You know what I mean? Like, it's just a round sound. So that's just like coincidental, has nothing to do with the book. Um, but I would love to hear your thoughts about it. It is scheduled to come out, um, like I said, February 2021. Um, and uh, I think it's going to be. Um, it's, it'll be interesting to hear what you guys think, what other people think about um, its themes and the things that it deals with. Super excited to hear about those. Um, and that is what I have for you. Um, let me know in the comments if you plan to read it, uh, if you have heard anything about it, um, any other uh, thoughts, comments you have on my particular uh, assessment of um, how long is too long or how short is too short in terms of historical context before we can realistically, you know, create um, a, a, a be maybe believable um, context around a historic event in this case presidency all right you guys thanks for showing up thank you for your likes shares and subscribes always so good to be talking about books with you here and i um, looking forward to seeing you again soon take care